So we are in week four of Slow Down. I'm so excited to be wrapping this up. Before we jump all the way in, we have a bunch of our uh, sixth through 12th graders heading out to movement camp tomorrow. It's always like the best day, uh, best week of the year. So we are so excited you guys be praying for them. And then make sure you get back here next Sunday. We got Movement Sunday. It's going to be a student takeover. And so get here, sit up close, support the kids and the, the students. It's going to be an awesome day. We're going to bring to you a little taste of Movement Camp. So trust me, you are going to love it. And you're not going to want to miss it. All right, one more time. Slow down. All right, let's look at Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. This is where uh, our whole series has come from. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. How many of you would like to learn to live freely and lightly at every moment? Have you ever had the experience uh, like I have where you think, wow, I don't feel very free or very light right now. I feel actually very heavy and very bound, and like I can't, uh, I may, may not even be able to make the choices I want to make, and my mind will not stop giving me all the options. It's because we have got to learn to take advantage of the gift that God gave us and Sabbath. And Sabbath just means rest, but it's not like we're taking a vacation or where we're just kicking our feet up. Rest for your soul, rest for your spirit, rest for your mind, rest for your body. Yes, but it is emotional and mental and spiritual all rolled in together. And we've been talking all month long about how do we Sabbath. And I felt like the Lord said to me, we need to learn not just how we should Sabbath, but why don't we Sabbath? What are the things that are stealing our Sabbath? And so today I want to talk to you about securing your Sabbath. And there's two ways that we can do that. The first one is to learn to be still with a purpose. And the second one is that we learn to set boundaries. And we're going to get to the boundaries in just a second, but don't be afraid because anytime you say the word boundaries, people are like, ah, just don't worry. Set a boundary right now that you're not even going to think about it till we get there, okay? But first thing we have to learn to do is be still with a purpose. Here's what I believe, that the reason we don't Sabbath, at the end of all of the line of reasons, it comes down to an identity issue. We don't know who we are. We're allowing all these external things to tell us who we are and who we are not. But there is a place where we can find out who we actually are and where, where the way that we were designed can come out in its fullness and it's when we learn to be still with a purpose. Isaiah 40, or Psalm 46.10, he says to be still and know that I am God. This describes Sabbath. Being still, not, it's not just being still. Because if I'm just still on the outside, but my eyes are not turned to the right direction, then I'm not Sabbathing, I'm just standing still. And when I learn to really Sabbath, there is actually movement that happens in Sabbath. It's forward movement into who God called me to be. Uh, Psalm 46, I mean, uh, yes, Psalm 46, 10, where he says to us, be still and know that I am God. Here's another translation, surrender your anxiety. Be still and realize that I am God. There is a requirement on us in Sabbath, and it's surrender. Without surrender, we can't have Sabbath. And when we don't surrender, we begin to lose our identity, or we never really even knew it in the first place, and so we let all these external things identify us. And when that happens, you know what the opposite, what steals our rest is busyness. Well, why are we busy? Because we have no boundaries. And why don't we have boundaries? Because we don't know who we are, so we say yes to everything. It's in the stillness that we begin to learn who we are. It's in the surrender that we say, this is who I am. And how do I know that? Because in Genesis, he says, uh, God says to everyone in heaven, but he's specifically talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. God spoke, let us make human beings. How many human beings are in the room? If you didn't raise your hand, we need to start there. <laughs> because you're a human. I don't see any aliens or animals in the room. Okay, so how many human beings are in the room? Perfect. Some of you still didn't raise your hand. It's okay. I know you're a human. You don't have to hide it anymore. 
This verse is written to all of us. Let us make human beings in our image. Whose image? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible. And a lot of us are running around trying to be responsible for things when we aren't reflecting the nature of the one who can make us responsible. And so we think we are responsible and we think we are holding things together, but we're actually being quite irresponsible because we don't have the nature of God who is the only one who can hold things together. And where do we find that nature? If we want to know ourselves, then we first must know the one whose nature we were made, whose image we were made in. And how do we know the one whose image we were made in? Back to Psalm 46, we have to be still. Can you see why the enemy is trying to rob your stillness? Can you see why he's throwing every possible option at you to fill your schedule and every moment and every day and even when you're laying in your bed with nothing to do that your mind is filled with all the things that you didn't do that you should have done because it is when you are still that you know God and it is when you know God that you know yourself. We got to learn to surrender and be still. You say, what are we surrendering? We're surrendering our will. We're surrendering our mind, our emotions. We're surrendering all the places where we feel like we're good enough, all the places where we feel like we failed today. We're surrendering all the things we think we should be doing, all the things that we shouldn't be doing. All of me surrender to all of God. And what we want sometimes is the identity to be affirmed in us, but instead of coming to God in full surrender, we are bringing him partial surrender. And then we wonder why we can't rest. It's because we cannot be responsible unless we know the one who is responsibility. We cannot carry what he's asked us to carry unless we look in the face of the one who empowers us to carry it. When we look at him, we know who we are. And when we don't look at him, we have no idea who we are. It's a trap because rest will secure your identity. But busyness keeps you seeking your identity in places you're never going to find it. And when we learn to rest, the trap is broken because when I am still with a purpose, that's where I learn my identity. And I want to tell you today what your identity is, because when we look at God, we see who he is, and in his nature, we can find who we are. This is who you are. If you are a Christian, according to the word of God, you are a treasured child of the king, redeemed from the curse, forgiven, a new creature in Christ. You are a partaker of his divine nature, led by his spirit, and strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are loved by the creator of the universe. You are the apple of his eye, his favorite, and it brings him pleasure to give you his kingdom. You can do all things with Christ who makes you strong, and his spirit in you is greater than anything you will ever face in this life. You are healed by his stripes, covered by his blood, protected in his name, and directed by his word. Satan has no power or authority in your life because you belong to Jesus. Jesus has made you a king and a priest unto God, You are more than a conqueror, the head and not the tail. You are above and not below. You are going over and not under. You are blessed coming. You are blessed going. Blessed in the city, blessed in the country. That's if you live in downtown Villarica or out where I live. In the city and in the country, you are blessed in the marketplace and blessed in your home. You are washed in his blood, perfect and blameless before God because of Jesus. You do not fear, but you have a sound mind and walk in authority in this life. You have the mind of Christ and are blessed with all spiritual blessings. No weapon formed against you will prosper. You will not be moved by what you see or what you feel because you walk by faith and not by sight. Your mind is being renewed every day as you read his word. You have a destiny, a heavenly vision that only you can fulfill. You are unique and specially gifted for that destiny. God's plans for you are good, bringing you peace and a secure future. He will never do you any harm. You are not an accident or 
an incident. You are here on purpose, with a purpose, for his purpose. You are God's workmanship, his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for specific good works. You express his personality, exhibit his power, and extend his kingdom. You live and breathe and find your very existence and meaning in Christ. You are saved, born again. It is no longer you who lives, but Christ living in and through you. You are heaven bound and will live forever with the one who gave his life for you. Nothing in this life compares with knowing and loving Jesus. You will live today to honor him because you are a winner in Christ. And that is what happens when you be still with purpose. When you learn to look in the face of Jesus, everything I just read to you, you can find in his face and in his word because the Bible was a love letter written to you from God. It was a love letter written 100% about him, but because he loves us so much, it's 100% about you and me too. It's when I look in there and see all of the incredible things that all of these people did and all the failures that all these people did, I can find myself in the middle of that word and I can take it and be still at the feet of the one who is the only only one who has the power to tell you who you are. And we cannot let the world tell us who we are. We can't. Everything in your life, everything in your life outside of Jesus wants to tell you who you're not. But there is one who, when we will be still and know that he is God, he will tell you who you are. And here's a very practical way you can learn to be still with purpose. Take this. Read it out loud over yourself every single day. If I had small children in my home right now, I did when we first, I don't know, 15 years ago, when we first sent this out, I read this over my kids every single day. Sometimes while they were sleeping, because you know, sometimes kids are like, stop being weird, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> you can find this out on the, uh, the new hair counter, or you can find it on our website under the resources page. But if you want true Sabbath, read it every day. Say it out loud over yourself every day. Don't just read it, hear it, because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Yeah. Let yourself hear it. But first, we have got to learn to be still with a purpose. Being still will confirm your identity in Christ. And when we know our identity in Christ, then we can set boundaries. So many times we try to set boundaries before we know our identity, and our boundaries end up hurting instead of helping. And what Jesus wants for you is boundaries that are healthy, that they will help you. Here's what a boundary, uh, a boundary is. It's a personal property line or limit that defines where you end and someone else begins. One of my favorite books uh, is called Boundaries. Uh, <laughs> and if you've ever counseled with me, then I pretty much can guarantee you I have recommended that book to you. Because 99% of the problems that we face are boundary problems because we don't know who we are. We have never paused and rested in his presence, and so we don't know what boundaries to set, or we don't have any. And a life without boundaries is chaos. And so here, here's what uh, the, he says in that book. A boundary shows me where I end and where someone else begins, leading me to a sense of ownership. Here's what I love about healthy boundaries, is they will help you know what is yours to own and what is not yours to own. And when we don't have boundaries in our lives, we are running around trying to own all these things that are not ours and our rest and our Sabbath quickly slip through our hands and when our Sabbath is gone, our identity is gone. And having boundaries, and here's what I want you to think, most of the time when you hear the word boundaries, you probably have a picture of a person in your mind. <laughs> and you're like, I need to set a boundary with that person. That person, they are annoying me. I need a boundary. <laughs> it's not really how boundaries work. 99% of the boundaries you're ever going to set are for you. It's your own boundaries. It's what you are not going to allow your mind to go to. What you are not going to allow your heart to go to. What you are not going to allow your spirit to go to. I want you to think about boundaries because sometimes our issue with boundaries is we think, oh, it's going to keep people out. That's not what boundaries are for. They are about keeping the gift and the destiny and the identity of God in you safe. It's not about keeping a person out. Boundaries are not about saying to Emmanuel, well, you, I don't like you, so you can't be in my life. A boundary is saying, this is the life that I'm going to live, and I would love for you to be a part of that within these safe boundaries. Do you want to come into my boundaries? 
A boundary is an invitation to healthiness. Now that's how you know, is the boundary healthy? Because if I can invite you in and it's healthy for us, then I have set a healthy boundary. Mo I want you to think, but I have a dog. I think he's awesome. His name is Elvis. He's really cute. He's a golden retriever. There you go. In case you wanted to know something personal about my life, he's amazing. And he gets hair everywhere. If you're thinking about getting a gold retriever, buy vacuums. <laughs> well, I love Elvis. I want him to live a long life. If I lived next to a really busy road and I loved my animal, what's the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to put in a fence. What do you call that? Is that because I hate the cars that are driving by? It's because I want to keep the thing that I love safe. And it's the same thing in our lives. God is doing something. When you are still with a purpose, you understand that God is doing something very precious and very world-changing in you. And my job, once I look in his face and learn who I am, my job is to defend at all costs what he is doing in me. And this is where you need to remember the scripture. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. So it's not that, oh, you know, Crystal is coming at me. Come at me, bro. Do people still say that? I don't know. That's not what it is. It's that I am saying to myself, Holy Spirit, where are my boundaries down? Where is my mind running out into a busy street? Where am I pushing my emotions onto a playground they're not supposed to be on? Where is my spirit unprotected? The Bible, it talks about it. You've got your, uh, your guards down and the gatekeepers have left the walls, which means I am open to every attack of the enemy. Yes. Boundaries close the gates to the things that should not be open in your life. And here's the beautiful thing about boundary. Once you make a boundary decision, I don't have to make that decision again. This is my boundary. This is what the Holy Spirit and I know is healthy for me and, I, and, accord, and, I, and it agrees with the word of God. Super important. Yeah. Do not set a boundary that disagrees with the word of God because that's not a boundary that's going to enslave you. Yeah. Boundaries agree with the word of God and keep you from being enslaved to things that he set you free from. Right. In Psalm 16, 5, they actually talk about boundaries and he says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup, you make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Listen to what the delightful inheritance is attached to. The boundary lines have fallen for me in delightful places, or in pleasant places, and surely I have a delightful inheritance. Do you know why the boundary lines are there in your life? <laughs> because you have a delightful inheritance. And our job is to protect that inheritance. What are you owning today that you should be releasing? There's three circles in your life. You have your circle of control, your circle of concern, and your circle of thought. Most of us live in the circle of concern, some of us in the circle of thought like we own it. And we don't. And there, I want you to think they're concentric circles, so you've got, you know, your first circle is like this big. In reality, it's like that big. Tiny circle, this first circle, this is your circle of control. Do you know what's in the circle of control? You. If it's not you, you can't control it. No matter who it is or what it is, if it is outside of you and your power of choice, you cannot control it. And if you can learn to put a spiritual and mental boundary in that constantly asks the question, is this in my circle of control? You will lose sleep over things that are in your circle of concern that you cannot control. And what happens when we do that is we switch the circles and now I'm focused on the circle of concern and I have left wide the gates to the circle of control and I have lost all self-control. I will sacrifice my self-control to try to control things that God never asked me to. Circle of concern for me, that's my husband, that's my kids, that's this church, that's you guys. I am concerned with you. I cannot control you. I cannot make you do as much as I want Michael, I don't know, <laughs> to put in a pool. <laughs> we don't have an HOA. I am the HOA. I approved it. <laughs> I 
Problem is the CFO will not sign off. <laughs> As much as I want Michael to put in a pool in my yard, I cannot control what he will or will not do in that situation. And I have tried. I have pleaded. I have begged. I have bribed. I have baked. I have done all the things. My kids, my husband, this church, as much as I want you to achieve everything that God has for you, I cannot control that. Does it concern me? Absolutely. Here's what I can do. I can help influence you. I can help lead you if you'll let me. So many of us are trying to lead people in our lives that have never asked us to do that and are running the other direction and we're losing sleep over somebody who isn't even thinking about you. And I don't mean that harsh, I mean that you have got to maintain your self-control. And here's the other thing, you have the circle of thought, it's the largest circle. As they go out from you, you have less and less concern, less and less ability to impact, less and less ability to influence. In the circle of thought are things like, oh, there's a war happening in Israel. Do I think about it? Yes. Can I do anything to change that? No. It's the upcoming presidential election. Some of you have moved politics into your circle of control and it's ruining you. You are losing relationships over things that God never asked you to draw a boundary in. Just because somebody thinks differently than you, that is not your control. That is not even your concern. It is a thought. And you know what the Bible says about your circle of thought? Take every thought captive to the word of God. Just because the thought comes through does not mean it has to enter into your circle of concern or control. Boundaries will keep you in the circle that God called you to be in because there are people who need you to stand in your circle. Boundaries will also help you draw a line for yourself. One of the reasons we can't rest is because we put no boundaries on ourselves. We think the American dream means that we never say no. We think that, oh, our kid is going to be the next greatest athlete, so I never say no to anything they ask me when it comes to that. Oh, real quiet, you guys. This is about to get a little, I know, all right? I feel like the Lord asked me to give some specific examples, so I'm going to, and I just want to say, at the beginning of this, me too. Been there, am there sometimes, but allow the Lord to just speak to you about what is you need to speak. My daughter... Uh, when she was young, she had severe FOMO. Like, it, that's fear of missing out. Incredibly severe FOMO. Every decision in her life was made about missing out. And I'm talking about she was a little girl. And it would be like, it's time for bed. She needed to go to bed. It was healthy for her to go to bed. Her authority figure said it's time to go to bed. But she knew that there were people in that living room and they might be doing something fun. <laughs> and we would look up and there would be this sweet, angelic, beautiful little face just peeking around the corner. (laughs) And I would say, it's bedtime, but you're in here. Yeah, but that's for me. This is for you. It was a healthy boundary for her, but she allowed her fear of missing out to override healthy choices. Now, she was three. When you're 43, it's not cute anymore. You'll start doing things like spending money you don't have because it validates something in you to make you feel better about yourself instead of being still and knowing that he is God and asking him to reveal every void in your life so that he can fill it. I'll start spending more than I make. I'll buy a house that's three times more than I should. And then when the boss calls and says, I need you to work 90 hours, I have taken away my power of choice to say no and I have no boundaries. And now my family suffers and my friends suffer and my church suffer because I didn't have any boundaries, and I didn't have any boundaries because I didn't know my identity. We will take these unresolved things in ourselves, and we will put them on our kids. And we have this fear of saying no to our kids, like it's going to wreck them, like it's going to stop them from what God called them to be. You cannot stop what God called them to be. What you can do is teach your kids healthy boundaries. You can teach them that there are such things in your life as a non-negotiable. You know, a non-negotiable for Michael and I is that our kids, they're gonna be in church. 
a non-negotiable for us is that we're gonna pray together, we're gonna read the word together, our kids are gonna serve in this house, and there are times that they loved it and times that they didn't, but the boundary didn't change based on the feeling of those around me about the boundary. I, you have to recognize, parents, when it comes to your kids, their destiny is more important than their gifting. And do not sacrifice on the altar of gifting today the destiny that he has for them tomorrow. And you know what'll keep you from doing that? A boundary. Decide, there are non-negotiables. A boundary is a non-negotiable. And we will run around trying to chase these things that, that we think, oh, they're gonna fill me up. And I don't know if you have ever caught one of the things that you thought was gonna fill you up. But it cannot fill you fast enough for all the leaking that is happening. Do you know the only place I've ever thought, wow, I feel filled? It's when I learned to be still with purpose. Yeah. It's when I learned to look at him and say, you get to tell me who I am. Amen. Not my dysfunction, not my family's dysfun dysfunction, not my friends, not what this world says. You get to tell me who I am. We, get, we drop our boundaries when it comes to our relationships because we need to be needed. We have this thing, oh, I, I need you to need me. And so you can call me at any time of the day or night. I will drop whoever I'm with, doesn't matter if it's my friends, my kids, my spouse, my job. I, I am always available to you because I need you to need me. Do you see what we think is serving is actually selfish? And we think, oh, if I can insert myself into my, all of my friend's life and, and, and solve all their problems. This is a tough one for pastors. We want to solve all your problems. When I hear you're hurting, I, I, my, my, my pastor, after a few years of this, sat me down and said, you understand you are not the Holy Spirit and you are not Mighty Mouse. And I have started getting this image of myself with a cape flowing and I'm like, I'm here to save the day. And when you say that out loud, you're like, that's really ridiculous, but that's how we feel inside. I'm here to save you. You know, there is only one who can save. Here's what I can say. I will show up in the midst and I will walk you to the one who can save, but I cannot make you go there. You have to choose to go there. I don't need you to need me. And when I don't need you to need me, I can bring the true self to a relationship. I can actually be what God asked me to be in a relationship when how you respond does not make me lose sleep but we will sacrifice our sanity on the altar of relationships. My biggest one was finding my identity in service. The more I do, the better I am. The more I work for God, the more God loves me. The more I can produce in his name, the more pleased he is gonna be with me. And honestly, at the bottom of it was probably like the better person that I'm gonna be, woohoo. I'm gonna get more crowns in heaven. And I remember the day that the Lord looked at me and said, you could do absolutely nothing. And it doesn't change how much I love you. I don't love you more because you work harder. I love you because Jesus saved you. But when we don't put boundaries in, we'll say yes to things that are crippling our family, are causing us to suffer in other ways because we think we have to say yes so that we can be affirmed. Well, I can't say no when the kid's school called and I've already committed to 17 other things this week. I gotta say yes because I'm the good mom. Maybe being the good mom is learning healthy boundaries so that when you are with your kids, you can be with your kids. Have you guys ever had the experience, you go to work, this is for those of us 40 and over, we remember when you were unreachable at work. Like in the summer, if you had a serious question, you could call your mom. But you had to talk to the receptionist and then you had to say, can I please speak to Mrs. Ashmore? And then they'd put you through and you'd be like, mom, there's two popsicles and Jeff wants both, can I have half? And uh, Melissa wants, you know, she wants this. And I just, and that's like what we interrupted our parents for. I'm sorry, I did that to you. <laughs> it's my sister over there. But now we are accessible to everybody 24 hours a day. You have a cell phone. You can be reached at any time. And you ever have this experience like I have? You go to work, 
and you're working, but there are 14 other things happening outside of work. You're getting calls from your kids, you're getting calls from your friends, you're getting texts from uh, your spouse, you're planning something and all these things are going in and then you get home that night and you can't just sit with your family because now all the things I didn't do at work, now I have to do them at home, but I'm trying to be like a good parent and a good spouse, but I'm also trying to be a good employee and instead of putting in a boundary that says I want to be present wherever I am, we try to be all things to all people at all times and we wear ourselves out. Boundaries will keep you present where you're supposed to be. And they're not always everybody's favorite. There are times my kids have tried to reach me and I'm like, I'm here right now. And they're like, but I am your kid. And I need to know this right now. But do you know what it teaches your kids? The difference between urgency and emergency. And we kind of run around living our lives like everything's an emergency, and a lot of times it's not even urgent. It's just a thought, a concern. Write it down. Let's talk about it when we're home. Boundaries will help you be present. And that's the best gift that you can give to anybody. It's the best gift you can give to your family. It's the best gift you can give to your boss. It's the best gift that you can give to your coworkers. It's the best gift that you can give to your friends. It's the best gift that you can give to your spouse is just to be present. We got to stop looking for our identity and all these things that are going to rob and make us slaves. If we can learn to be still with a purpose, we can find out who we are. And today, I felt like he just wanted us to do that for a minute. You know, when, when we try to, to own things that aren't ours to own, it yokes us together but it's not the kind of yoke that he talks about in Matthew 11 that is, uh, that is going to accomplish the destiny of God for your life. It actually is going to pull you back into slavery. I become a slave to, you know, the news for the day. I become a slave to whatever it is. Fill in your own blank. But identity will bring freedom. And today, he doesn't want you to be a slave. He calls you a son and a daughter. And if he says it, it's already done. So it's not that he needs to do another thing. It's that we need to surrender. And maybe today you've never surrendered for the first time. You've never said yes to Jesus. You're hearing all this and you're like, that kind of life sounds awesome, but I don't even think I know how to do that. The same Jesus who died for you rose from the dead for you so that you could have the power to live the kind of life that he has for you. And today he would love for you to say yes to him. He's already said yes to you a million times over. Or maybe today you've, you've said yes to Jesus, but you walked far away from him and you've realized, man, I'm picking up all these things and, and I've turned my back on him. Today, it's just a simple yes again to say to him, I, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry that I walked away from you. He never left. And in that instant, he will bring you right where you're supposed to be. So if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, if that's you today, you would like to say yes to Jesus. For the first time, are you ready to come back to him today? I would love to pray with you. We're not gonna make you come forward or do anything. I just wanna know that I'm praying with you. So if that's you, I just want you to lift your hand and put it right back down. If you'd like to say yes to Jesus today, thank you. Or you'd like to thank you. You'd like to say yes again to Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're ready to join these others. Thank you and say yes to Jesus. Thank you. I'm going to say a prayer, and I want you to say something like this in your heart to God right now. Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for sending me Jesus. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died and rose again, and I ask you to be my Lord. I receive your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, be my best friend. Heaven is my home, and Jesus is my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.